this is Lisa Kurtz. I am going to give a presentation about vascular ultrasound and so what uh, and everything we do in the vascular lab. So I'm going to first of all explain just the different tests that we do and here they are. So the first one is a cerebrovascular, most frequently called a carotid ultrasound. Next is arterial uh, ultrasound, both upper and lower extremity. Venous ultrasound, both upper and lower extremity. The abdominal aorta, which includes the iliac arteries. The renal arterial ultrasound, which is different from a renal ultrasound. A renal ultrasound is just an ultrasound of the kidneys, most frequently done in radiology. The renal artery ultrasound is actually looking at the arteries to the kidneys and measuring the blood flow to the kidneys. Celiac mesenteric, those are the arteries that feed blood to the digestive organs. TCPO2, also called the TCOM, those are um, done, we do outpatient and uh, the radiology staff does the inpatient and they frequently do them for um, amputation so that the orthopedic doctors know the level of amputation. And uh, we do it most frequently for um, just peripheral arterial disease and to, to evaluate the um, uh, healing, healing of a, a limb. Physio, physio, physiologic arterial, all, most commonly in ABI, which is an ankle brachial index, that's taking blood pressures in the ankle and the arm and comparing those. And then vascular screening, which uh, we've been doing for several years now. And for those we do, we offer three, the carotid, the aorta, and an ABI. These are the types of graphs with the corresponding orders, what to place for these specific graphs. Um, I don't know how often you guys put orders in for graphs, but if we do it, we do all of our recalls, we enter them ourselves, which saves, um, saves the physician having to and the nursing staff having to do that. And we're pretty, pretty well versed on the synopsis for some what to place. So aorta air, bifemoral graft, we're going to do an aorta because we're going to look at the, at the graft in the belly and we're going to do a limited ultrasound. And it says 109 or 110. The 109 is a left, the 110 is a right. It doesn't matter which one for that you order, but basically we're going to check the aorta, the, the graft, and we're going to look at the, um, the air to bifemoral ties into the femoral vein, femoral arteries in the groin, and we check that, and then we check just the outflow. So we just do the upper part of the thigh, checking those arteries, making sure that there is no blockage. It typically happens at an anastomosis. Anastomosis is where the graft ties in. So we always check those as well. Air to biliac, that's just basically stays within the, the belly. And the aortic straight graft, uh, the air to bifemoral and air to biliac are called, it's like a Y graft. So it comes down and it Ys, one going to each limb. An aortic straight graft is they just literally stay within the aorta. They do not go below the um, aorta and into the iliacs. Fem, fem graft, femoral to femoral, that's where the, one of the iliac arteries is blocked and so they will take a graft and tie it from one femoral to the other femoral. And so we will evaluate that and it depends upon which way it's going. So if it is a right to left, we're going to, you're, you would order a left. And the reason being is that you're perfusing the left limb. That's why you order a left. Same thing left to right, you're perfusing the right limb because there was an occluded occlusion on the right. So a right limb with, with ABI. Femoral to distal graft, that starts in the femoral, goes in either the popliteal, above or below the knee, and it can go um, as far down as the ankle. And that is depending upon which side, left or right. Axillary to femoral graft, that's where they actually, they have to bypass the aorta and they, put, they start the, in the axillary artery in the arm. They tunnel that graft, it's right down and it's just basically underneath the skin and it, you, can, you can actually see it on the patient. It looks like a hose coming right down and they tie it into the, the femoral artery. Sometimes it is an axillo by fem graft and they'll come down and they'll tie it, tie it into both femoral arteries. And that shows which graft, uh, which order to place for that. First, and we'll, we do a right upper limb because we have to check the inflow to that graft. So we're checking the artery to the graft, so the part of the artery in the arm, the subclavian, going to the, the graft, the graft itself, and then the outflow. And then, the, uh, so there's an axillary, right axillary and left axillary to femoral. Okay. Oh. The proto 
protocol for follow-up graphs, they, um, and usually the surgeon's office or now, who else orders these? The floor nurses are going to be ordering these? Well, now? no, probably the, the extender will still put, get those. The extender will? Yeah. Okay. So um, in the prep recovery area, they are calling. Okay. Four to six weeks post-op, every six months the first year, and then annually thereafter. And the reason they do it a little bit frequently originally is because if a graft is going to fail, it tends to fail in the first year. So it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So we usually monitor it more closely that first year. Stent grafts in the legs, the protocol is the same as above, every four to six weeks, every six months and annually. Patch grafts in the legs, um, if they only do those uh, the first year and then only after that it's only as needed for symptoms. non grafts so that's angioplasty or stent, that they, these are not routinely followed unless the physician specifically orders it. And he may order it because maybe this patient has had multiple interventions and they continually fail and they don't want to wait. They, they're just going to check it to make sure that it's not going to have any problems. Oh, that doesn't read very well up there. But that's in your packet. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but these are basically the orders. So um, all of our orders and the order number. And I know from experience that sometimes our orders are not easy to find because we're different than the radiology orders. So if you know the number, the procedure ID number, that is going to be very helpful. And I think a lot of the nursing staff have been given a, a full sheet of that already. Right. And upstairs on the prep recovery, I made all these their favorites. And okay. Them up, so. Okay, good. Yeah. Very good. One thing I want to say is there, and it's kind of hard to see, but there's some that say left without ABI, right without ABI. There's up there bilateral without ABI. Try to avoid those. Please, because if you order it without an ABI and the doctor doesn't specifically state that, then we have to go in and correct that order. So there would be very rare that anybody would ever need to be put in an order for an, without an ABI. That's just the second page of that. And we, um, several of us went and did a little in-service with family practice doctors <laughs> And this is just something we could communicate to them to help them know what orders to place for the vascular, for vascular ultrasounds. So we told them, you know, if, if the patient is complaining of claudication, burning, cramping, um, or they have absent or faint pulses, this is what they should order. So it's a color flow bilateral with ABI, or if they sometimes they just want to order an ABI. They, they, the patient has really vague symptoms, and they're like, well, maybe, but I'm not quite sure. Let's just do an ABI. If they suspect an abdominal aortic aneurysm and they, they palpate the aorta and they can feel that uh, aorta bounding, they'll order um, a complete abdominal aortic ultrasound. If it's a family history, they should not be ordering that. That, that is because insurance will not cover that. Carotid brewery, TIA stroke, amaurosis fugax, which is visual, visual changes, and that's usually where a patient says, I just lost partial vision in one eye. It's like a, a shade came down. That can indicate a um, blockage in those arteries, so they will do order a carotid Doppler. Hypertension, increased creatinine, um, those are for the renal artery ultrasounds. Bilateral, the only time that a unilateral should be ordered is if a patient has a known single kidney. And a lot of times um, we get orders from the kidney doctors, the nephrologists, and that, that nephrologist knows they only have one kidney and they'll still sometimes order a bilateral and we have to change it. But um, we will check those arteries to the kidneys. Leg edema, swelling pain, suspect DVT or insufficiency. Uh, it's important for them to state which one. The reason being is um, insufficiency studies take a little bit longer, and a lot of times we have two people in there because when we do an insufficiency study, the after we the first thing we do is rule out a DVT because the DVT sort of trumps insufficiency. If they have a DVT, we need to address that. So we have the patient come in, they're laying down, we do a, a an ultrasound ruling out a blood clot with no DVT. Then we stand the patient and we put a blood pressure cuff around their. Um, calf or their ankle and we put the ultrasound probe over the vein and we squeeze and release 
And so what we're watching is that we're, when we squeeze that blood, that blood flow shoots up, and then if the valves are working, that blood flow stops. It does not, you know, go back down to their leg. If they have insufficient valves, what happens is we squeeze, the blood flow goes up, we release, and you can see it on the ultrasound machine, it just whoosh, and that blood flow is flowing right back down because those valves aren't working. So we have a, a what's called an insufflator. It's a machine that gives a predetermined amount of pressure in that blood pressure cuff. And so we have an insufflator machine, we have the ultrasound machine, the patient standing, and we have two people in there. So it, it's helpful to know if that's what we're looking for because we need to coordinate that. Um, the hospital, ne I've never seen the hospital ever evaluate for insufficiency. Never. So if they want insufficiency, we're here because they've never, I've never seen any ultrasound study that they have ever done on veins that they even mentioned any kind of ins insufficiency. They only look at blood clots. So those are the three, the bilateral, left or right. Arm edema swelling pain, same thing if they're suspecting a blood clot. Those are the upper extremity left and right. Abdominal brewery, uh, that's vast 150 mesenteric artery ultrasound. We evaluate the aorta, the celiac, the osteal, and the proximal renal arteries, and the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. So a brewery is an abnormal noise in an artery. And if there's a brewery in that belly, it could be any one of those arteries. So the best thing to order is a mesenteric so we can evaluate all of those areas and see where is that brewery coming from. This is, a, this is also a, what we told the family doctors, that if they have a family history of an aneurysm, stroke, or peripheral arterial disease, and again, insurance companies will not cover that. The best thing to do is order a vascular screening. They're, it's $49. We um, give the patient the results right then and there. They get to take a copy with them. And if it's an epic doctor, or even if it's not an epic doctor, if that doctor is in epic with a fax number, we will send that doctor a copy of their report. Um, there used to be, as many of you know, there used to be the Parkview screening bus. That's gone. I don't know if everybody knows that. That is gone. They have, they have canceled the contract with that bus. So it's no longer around. These are the most frequently used diagnosis and study. This, it shows the study description, the cerebrovascular. These are the most frequently used diagnoses codes. And as everybody knows, when ICD-10 came along, it changed everything, and they, you have to be way more specific. So um, I just wanted to kind of let everybody know, and I think most of the nursing stations have these codes, to, to use these codes. Um, one thing, carotid artery disease is not a payable diagnosis. Makes no sense to me. Carotid artery disease and carotid artery stenosis are pretty much the same thing, but disease Will, will not be, Medicare won't pay for it. So the, the I-65, 21, 22, 23, those are the, the codes you should use for if it, we, they know they have a stenosis in an artery in the carotid arteries. Um, let me see any of those up. The um, R09.89, that code, if you type that in, that can bring up a bunch of different things. And so you just need to make sure you're looking for the right description when if you pull up that code and then the bottom one the r42 dizziness they they don't want that used all by itself they prefer that dizziness code be used with another um, corresponding code renal artery renal artery ultrasound most common reasons that is ordered for for chronic kidney disease and hypertension and then of course if they have known renal artery stenosis or atherosclerosis of the renal artery abdominal aorta. There would be, I can't, I don't know any time any of the doctors would ever order a limited. They don't, they shouldn't, they should always order a complete. Um, and then these are the reasons after a sclerosis of the aorta, which is basically our plaque buildup. Aneurysm um, without rupture or ruptured. Aneurysm of the iliac artery. Abdominal aortic tasia. Again, ectasia is not an, a true aneurysm. It's just where it sort of enlarges before it narrows. And that can turn into an uh, aneurysm, so that's why we monitor that. There's that R09.89 code again. 
So like I said, when you pull that up, it's going to show all different kinds of stuff. For an abdominal aortic ultrasound, um, you would look, the two probably of the 0989 codes are the Bruy or a prominent abdominal aorta. And then if they have an aortic graft, that Z95.828 code, that brings up presence of other vascular implants and grafts. That will bring up a just a bunch of different grafts. And so you just need to pay attention to what graft they would have. Peripheral arterial ultrasound, upper and lower. Um, these are the same codes used for ABIs, for upper extremity. Um, the upper extremity, I think, might be a little gold on the second page. Nope, that's faint. It's upper extremity. They, uh, yep, pain in right arm usually. 79.601, that's usually pain. Um, the 77.1 near the bottom, stenosis of the subclavian or irradial artery. Uh, that 77.1 code, that's another code that brings up a bunch of different options. If they know there is a um, blockage in a subclavian artery, they will order that. And sometimes a doctor will order, he wants to place an order because their blood pressures in the arms are different. So let's say the arm pressure is on the right is 170 and on the right and the left is a is 130. Well, they're like, okay, you know, and then, and then they'll order a bilateral. They don't need to order a bilateral. We need to evaluate the one with the lower blood pressure. And the reason we're lo looking at the one with the lower blood pressure is the reason it has the lower blood pressure could be because there's a blockage in the artery to that arm. So we will order, they, they should order probably an upper extremity pressure study, which is that VAS 115, let us look at the blood pressures and measure with a machine because sometimes they'll say they got a difference and then we'll use a physiologic machine and the blood pressures are the same. And then we will go on and do an ultrasound of the arm with the lower blood pressure. Let's see. Venous ultrasound, upper and lower, DVT. And, uh, and it shows um, different codes for whether it's an upper extremity, whether it's a lower extremity, whether it's right, left, bilateral. Um, localized edema, um, superficial vein from thrombus or phlebitis, that's also a different code. And all those codes are on here. So for ulcer, like if you have a lower extremity ulcer, it would be the I80-.01, you know, would you use that? Because it's inflammation, or let me see if there's. Well, we can talk about it. You know, because I, I think I had to put one in, and I don't, I didn't get any in basket staying. It didn't work. And that's what I used. Well, ulcer. I think if you type in ulcer, they want to know where the ulcer right. is. And I used that too. So okay. I used. You used two codes. Yeah. That's probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would be good. Venous insufficiency. Varicose veins. No, that's just continued. Mesenteric artery ultrasound. Um, that's a hard one sometimes to code if they don't know uh, for certain. And they should never put a code. Um, it, like, for instance, um, if they suspect a DVT, they should never use a DVT code. You can't use that code unless that's a proven thing. Um, so, Usually for the mesenteric, they use, it's for an abdominal bruit, which is the R09.89, their generalized abdominal pain, or if they know they have a uh, stenosis in one of those arteries, they are, there are codes that state that. Pseudoaneurysm. So we do evaluate for pseudoaneurysms, but we usually try to refer them over to radiology, and the reason being is if they come to us and we do a pseudoaneurysm evaluation, if it's positive, we send them over to radiology because they're going to do a procedure. Radiology does, repeats the ultrasound and they get paid and we don't. So we always try to send them to radiology, we refer scheduling to radiology. Now, having said that, there are certain doctors who will say, nope, want it done here. Well then, we'll do it. And then we'll, if, we, if it's positive, then we just, we just take the hit. So. Um, and then that is ordered right VAS 107 or VAS left 106. And that, we don't do a full leg, we're just basically evaluating for a pseudoaneurysm and uh, it's done without an ABI. So that, those two are the two codes that are without ABI. 
Here again, this is what I already said. For carotid artery ultrasound, please do not use carotid artery disease. We have to then, that what happens is that gets used and, and nurses and physicians both use that constantly. And so scheduling calls us and says, will you please change this for us? If it's, um, and most often it's, it's been a while ago, if it's, if, they, if it's a same day thing, I will say, you call that nurse. Because I want that nurse to understand that code is not a payable diagnosis. Um, when you enter this code the, for stenosis, the first thing that pops up is carotid artery occlusion. And so I'm just requesting to pay attention when you're using those codes to see what it says. Because you don't want to set, select that, even though it's 6521, underneath that there's carotid artery stenosis, there's carotid artery occlusion, but the first one that pops up is occlusion. Please don't use that unless you know, because you're giving that patient a diagnosis that they have an occluded carotid artery. And we don't want to do that if they don't. Uh, let's see. R09.9, that's another code again that brings up, that and the Z95.828, they bring up, I mean, just like you have to scroll through. There are a lot, a lot of codes underneath those, um, descriptions underneath those codes. Please kind of just scroll through that. And if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. We will be happy to help you. I think that was the last one. Does anybody have any questions? I think I need a full body evaluation. <laughs> Does anything not make sense? No. I think it certainly um, opens your eyes to the number of things that you have to watch out for. Oh, yeah. It's very, yeah, ordering for vascular and scheduling for vascular is very complex. And doing, doing vascular is very complex. You know, echo, when they have an echo, the echo tech is in there, you know, 20, 30 minutes, I think. When you're doing a vascular ultrasound, I mean, it's nothing, it's not unusual, especially if they're having, let's say they're having a carotid in a leg, that patient is on our bed and we are hands-on for two hours. That's a long time. Yeah. It is. And sometimes they're coming in for an echo and a myo view and a vascular study. These patients are here all day. I mean, they're, they're leaving here and they're exhausted. And I understand that. That's that's a long day for them. That's a really long day. Lisa? Yes? Are the docs aware of these different codes and stuff? Because I would say 90% of the time, my doctor puts his own codes in. They've been given the same information, but you know, you know how it is. They've been given the same information. Yeah, yeah, and, there, and and whenever we ha I have an update, I always let them know. Whenever I update that form, I let them know. But you know, you know how that goes. So, but yes, they are aware. Yeah, and some doctors are, you know, especially the the peripheral doctors, they're a lot more aware. They should be. Yeah, but but not always. I mean, I still have Dr. Chastain who orders carotid and puts carotid artery disease. And then you know we have to change it. We have to change it. Yeah. So, have you guys ever notified the physicians and nurses of that so that they're they were aware? Oh, yeah. Like, numerous times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's. I mean, I understand. Sorry. Vascular. I mean, it's it's hard. It is. Yeah. It is. And 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 you know we know it because that's our world. They have to. They. I mean, they have way more than just vascular sure. to consider. I can't even imagine. So. Yeah. So it's better to go to you if it's farther out, like how you change it, instead yes. of sending it to that doctor nurse. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Usually, you get a hold of me, it'll be done. I can usually get that done re relatively quick. Okay. Yeah. Can the secretaries change it too? No. It has to be you. It has to be one of us. Okay. Not just me. I mean, any of the sonographers can change it. But they, oh, scheduling, okay. usually, scheduling usually contacts me because I, I, I will do it as quick as I can and, and they're usually, you know, it, it, it's just easier to contact me gotcha. if I'm here. I'll be happy to do that. I have no problem changing codes. Do it all the time. Scheduling usually won't even schedule it if it's got the wrong code. Yeah. Right? I mean, they check it while you're on the phone. Yeah, yeah, and and you guys will get to under get to know that as quick. But hallelujah. Yeah, <laughs> they 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 are really versed on. Oh no, that that isn't going to pass. And you know they'll tell they'll tell you right right then and there, and then they then have you change it. Yeah. Yeah. And a difference between radiology, and I don't know how many of you know this, radiology, 
ultra vascular ultrasound and cardiology vascular ultrasound. Not only do our cardiologists read our vascular ultrasounds, but we have a totally different diagnostic criteria. So what we say, what they say is 60%, many, many times, <laughs> our di diagnostic criteria would say it's 25%. Really? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And we, it, that's a dream of mine, is to get one diagnostic criteria for all of Parkview vascular ultrasound. So, yeah. Because, because you know, yeah. So why is it that way? Just because radiology uses their own diagnostic criteria under the radiology code, code yeah, whatever. yeah, and we, you know, we have, we have, yeah, and I, I have, I would have to say, you know, I know I'm biased that that cardiology is ours is more accurate. Sure. One of the reasons reasons is like when Dr. Chastain started many years ago, um, he would be going into the cath lab doing a, our carotid um, arteriogram. And it, the ultrasound had been done in radiology, and their report would say there was a 70 or 80 percent blockage, and he would get them in there, and there was like 30 percent, and and he would be, you know, he would not be happy. Yeah, so he, that is <laughs> maybe, that's quite a, it, it quite it really is. And when he first started, there were, there were several times he would see a patient in the office, and he would say he would call us and he would say radiology says it's 70 percent. I'm going to send. Can you look? I'll, I don't want you to do a full study, just look at that one segment and tell me, is it 70%? And sometimes you would say, yes it is, and sometimes you would say, no, it's not. So, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, and it's all, it, a lot of it's based upon the diagnostic criteria. Hey, Lisa, yes. What you just said, we have to say to patients a lot where they'll say, oh, do I have to come here? Can I just get it in Kalamazoo? And, and I tell them, well, if it says less than 50, is it 16 or is it and then they're like, oh, yeah. So they kind of can see comparing apples and oranges. It makes a big difference. It, what we're going to do for them is listen. Yes, yes. It is. It is a big difference. So, yeah. Any questions? Comments? No. All righty. I appreciate everybody coming. Hopefully, this was informative and was. answered any questions you had. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome.